thank you all for having me this evening. So, uh, my name is Emily Oldridge, and I am the educator at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center. So, I've been at the museum, this is going on my ninth year, and I give tours and I teach art classes. And my favorite of all our collections, so it is an art museum, and we have contemporary art. We usually have five different exhibitions every year. So as you come during the different seasons, you'll get to see different artwork. Uh, we concentrate on regional artists, and then if we can get something really spectacular from outside of the region to bring the portions to show to people, we also do that. So uh, I encourage you to come and check out the museum. It's always free. We're open from 10 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, and also Saturdays from 1 to 5. Uh, so we also have concert series. So we've got a classical concert coming up on Sunday, November 6th. Uh, at 2 p.m. is Carolyn Oatman, who is an international pianist, uh, so you're also invited to attend that. Uh, we just had an exhibition opening for a Cleveland artist named Chris Pico, and his work is up at the museum, and it's really great. Uh, also, the museum has a performing arts affiliate, which is the Cirque de Art Theater on Chillicothe Street. So it is an acrobatic circus and dance school that serves about 300 students all the way from children to adults. And they put on several performances every year. Their uh, feature signature performance is the Nutcracker, which will be at the Vern Reich Center in December. Uh, but the next upcoming performance is going to be Hansel and Gretel, their spooky Halloween performance. And that will be in the museum's Hopkins Theater on the last two Saturdays of the month. They'll have a matinee at 3.30 and also a show at 7 p.m. Uh, so I do encourage you, if you haven't seen them perform, they are absolutely amazing. Uh, but my favorite out of all of our collections at the museum is what is known locally here as the Wurtz Collection. So the museum has this collection on display for the public all the time in a permanent exhibition which is called Art of the Ancients. And there are over 10,000 prehistoric Native American artifacts in this collection which are mostly local and a lot of these are related to the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. Uh, so when I came to the museum, I knew absolutely nothing about this material. Uh, so I, of course I needed to be able to tell people about it, so I decided I needed to do some research. And when I first started researching, it seemed very straightforward. I could go to the Ohio History Connection and look and see what their material was. And I was like, okay, I can get a handle on this. But then the deeper I went into it and the more I started researching, I realized, oh my goodness, there's just so much that they don't know about this, and there's so much mystery involved with it. Uh, so it's really held and captivated my attention for all of these years, and uh, now it is my favorite collection. So I've been working for the last two years putting together a book, uh, because what is interesting is this collection came to the museum in the early 2000s after Bill Wirtz passed away. And uh, when it came to the museum, we knew it was local. We knew where some of the pieces originated because they had the locations where they were discovered written on the objects. But there weren't very many out of the 10,000 pieces that we knew exactly where they came from. But uh, Madeline Wirtz, Bill's widow, passed away in 2014, and the contents of her house were gifted to the Portsmouth Salvation Army. And what they found among those items at the Salvation Army was a small metal box that was a card catalog. And this card catalog had the contents of the catalog for Charles Wirtz's portion of the collection. So the Wirtz collection was collected by a father and son. Charles Wirtz was the dad. He was born in the late 1800s when they first started excavating these mounds. Uh, when the state of Ohio came down and they excavated the Tremper Mound in West Portsmouth and they excavated the Fort Mounds and Village uh, where Clay High School, near where Clay High School is now, Charles Wirtz was involved in those excavations and they actually consulted him about where to look and what to expect. Uh, so he, Charles Wirtz was very generous and he thought this material was really important. We are really in debt to Charles Wirtz because most of what the mounds that were here were destroyed during the development of the city, but Charles Wirtz had the foresight to know that the material that was found here was really important and it was gonna be important for generations to come. So to put it in context, you have to think about when he was alive, like as a teenager, they were still warring. The US government was making war with Native Americans across the Western frontier and in the plains, so they were still 
fighting the Indians. And so if your dad or your grandpa got killed by an Indian, you're not going to really care so much about their material that they left in the mounds and Indian artifacts. Uh, and a lot of the artifacts that were the most important ones that were found around these complexes in Chillicothe ended up in the British Museum. And the reason why is because nobody here was interested. So they asked everybody in Ohio, hey, do you guys want this stuff? Nobody cared about it. They asked everybody in the whole country if they wanted it, and nobody cared about it. And so now you can fly to London, and you can go to the British Museum, and you can look at stuff that came from right here in Ohio. Uh, but Charles Works, luckily for us, knew back then that this was important material, and he had a passion about it and collected these items. So he had a real estate and construction company that built a lot of the houses in the hilltop area of Portsmouth. Uh, so that's where a majority of the items in the collection originated. Uh, but in 2016, the Salvation Army gifted the museum the collection to the Charles Wirtz catalog. So Charles Wirtz had actually donated his portion of the collection to the city of Portsmouth in 1926 in order for it to be put onto public display for free. And uh, that actually was housed in the Portsmouth Public Library. So some of you might remember some of the cases in the library <laughs> with the Native American artifacts. That was Charles Wirtz's portion of the collection. And it was actually at the library where the catalog was created. So Charles Wirtz brought the material to the library. He set up the locked cases. He added labels to the collection. But at the library in the 1940s, there was a woman named Aurelia Huxall. Uh, her husband was Lawrence Huxall, who was a preacher here in Portsmouth, and she worked at the library. She actually had her master's degree in archaeology, so she was really interested, and she took it upon herself to make this catalog. And so each of the catalog cards has written descriptions of the artifacts. A lot of times they have illustrations of the artifacts, and if they knew where they had originated, she would also write that down. Uh, so most of the catalog is blank as far as where things came from, but we do now know where about a thousand of those objects out of the 10,000 objects originated, and a lot of those came from the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. Uh, so when we were closed down in 2020 at the museum, I decided to put together a book that was about those objects that we knew were uh, from areas that were part of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. And then in the process of doing this, I wanted to put them in context, and I realized that nobody's really told the story of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex before. So I had to do that in order to tell everybody about the artifacts, and so I'm still in the process of wrapping it up, and I'm hoping to have it done uh, by the end of the year. But I'm going to go ahead and pass around uh, a couple maps here so that you guys have an idea of what I'm talking about. So this has a front and back. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you can take one and pass it on. So, um, during my research, I realized that the Portsmouth Earthworks complex was at one point in time the largest prehistoric earthen mound complex in the entire world. So, that is Portsmouth's claim to fame. Can you say that again? I said the Portsmouth Earthworks complex at one point in time was the largest prehistoric earthen mound complex in the entire world. So there are additional mound complexes, like you can visit Mount City in Chillicothe, you can visit the Hopo Earthworks, you can go to Peebles and you can visit Serpent Mound, and there's some really spectacular, amazing mounds. They estimated that uh, there were over 10,000 mound sites within the state of Ohio, and that's probably more, because a lot of times they would lump multiple mounds into one grouping. Uh, but Portsmouth is by far the largest. So I knew it was big, but I didn't realize it was the biggest one in the whole world. Uh, but I looked at the record holders, which uh, there's a big uh, complex in Louisiana called Poverty Point, which is huge. There's also uh, Cahokia in Illinois, and those ones don't even come close to the size that we have here in Portsmouth. Uh, so the Smithsonian Institution, their first publication was a book. It's called Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And a couple of guys, Squire and Davis, put together uh, maps of all kinds of mounds. And actually, I should give you guys these, too. So you can take one of these and pass them around. There's a map on the very back of the one I'm handing out now, which came out of that book by Squire and Davis. And it was created as a map of the complex in uh, 1847, and it was published in 1848. 
So the most famous map of the Portsmouth Earthworks is this one that was created by Squire and Davis. And they reported that if you laid out all the mounds end to end, like all the pathways and all the mounds and all the embankments, that it would be almost 22 miles of mounds that are in the area. Uh, the first paper that I passed out, it has the green map on the front. And if you take a look at that, the main parts of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex are A, B, C, and D. So A is located on the west side, and it is in Kentucky in South Portsmouth. And B is centered around Mound Park, it's where the Horseshoe Mound is. C was the Temple Mound, and that was located in Siloam, kind of near where the Hardin Greenhouse is. And then D was a little bit to the west of that. Uh, it's actually on the property of Mark West Hydrocarbon. And the, if you measure the distance from Group A in South Portsmouth to Group C in Siloam, straight across in a line, is seven miles. If you follow those pathways, so there's parallel embankments, which were three, or three to five feet high, 25 feet wide and about 150 feet apart, and they made pathways that led from one part of the complex to another. So Mountain Park was kind of the hub of the wheel, and from Mountain Park, these pathways radiated out in the intermediate direction. So they had one that went to the northwest, they had one that went to the southwest, one that went to the southeast, and one that went to the northeast. And they kind of made these pathways, we think, for people to make a procession from one grouping of the earthwork to the other. So if you follow the pathways from Group A to Group B at Mound Park and then back down to the Temple Mound in Kentucky, it's eight miles. So just the sheer size of it alone, the recognized portions are pretty amazing. But if you look at that whole area on that green map, we're talking about 12 miles uh, from the top to the bottom. So it's just a huge huge area that all of these mounds covered at one point in time. Now there are portions of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex that are left. So in Mound Park, we have the Horseshoe Mound. That one's our most famous mound. So that one is about 12 feet tall, 180 feet long by 160 or so feet wide. But there's also other parts that are left in Mound Park. So there's actually a, what they call a conical mound. So it's kind of like a cone-shaped mound. And there's a low mound there in Mound Park just to the northeast of the Horseshoe Mound. So if you go to Mound Park, it looks like a small rise and there's two kind of younger trees growing out of it. That was a mound at Mound Park. And then up where the buildings are, where the children's home used to be located, there, that part is elevated about 18 feet above the rest of the park. And that was what Squire and Davis called the natural elevation. So it's never been investigated to see whether it's actually natural or not. It ended up extending to the east about 600 feet, they think. And if you look at the size of the entire complex, 600 feet isn't that far. So it's possible that that built up part was at least modified by people during prehistoric times. Uh, so there's some different sites along the way. We're talking about the ones that are still here. So Group A in South Portsmouth, Kentucky, there's a large portion of that earthwork that's still around. It's on private property, it's not open to the public. There is a portion of the middle square there that is owned by the Archaeological Conservancy of Kentucky, which I think that they're trying to buy up property there as people decide to sell it. Um, and it would be really neat at one point in time for people to be able to visit it. But if you drive down Route 8 in Kentucky and you see the historical marker for Shenoa, which was Lower Shawnee Town in Kentucky, the square of the old Fort Earthwork runs down the tree line near that sign. So from the road, you can see it. The square of the old Fort Earthwork was 800 feet by 800 feet. And the wings that came off of it were 1,500 feet long. So this is just a huge, huge thing that prehistoric people made. And we do know from Charles Wurtz's reports and also from the excavations that these mounds were built by people carrying basket loads of dirt. So there was a mound um, up on the hilltop at the corner of Grant and High Street, which was called the Lawson Mound. Uh, so it's no longer there. When they were going to tear it down to build houses up there, uh, it was actually so hard that they had to bring in dynamite and blow it up. Uh, but what they did find <laughs> while they were trying to demolish it was two baskets that were woven. So they were made out of some type of vegetable material or reed in that they were turned upside down with the earthen loads in them. So they think there was about 30 pounds of dirt in each of these baskets and people would carry this dirt and just pile it up to make the mounds. 
And when they excavated Group A, the Old Port Earthwork in South Portsmouth, when they cut into the side of the mound, they could see the layers of dirt because they were different colors. So they must have been taking this dirt from kind of different locations and then just piling it up. And you could see those little humps that each basket load of earth made. So it's pretty impressive. They must have had a decent population down here to be able to move the tons of earth that it took to create all of these earthen mounds. Uh, so group A is still around. Uh, group B, we have that small portion in Mount Park. Group C is demolished. It's no longer there, so the Temple Mound's not there anymore. But Group D, the Biggs Mound, is still there in Kentucky. So that one is on the property of Mark West Hydrocarbon, which is now a subsidiary of Marathon. And uh, last I heard, they were in negotiations with the Kentucky Archaeological Conservancy, and they were looking to purchase the mound and perhaps open it to the public, which would be fantastic because it's located really near the wildlife area there. So there's already a place where people can park and kind of look at it. So if you ever are in the parking lot there by the wildlife area, if you look over the fence into the cattle pasture, you can see kind of a ring of trees, kind of a circular area of trees, and that is the Biggs Mound. So there's still a low embankment which surrounds it, and there's a ditch on the inside, and there's a little mound in the middle. Uh, so as far as the other earthworks go, um, what we have left is not a whole lot. So we have uh, the Tremper Mound in West Portsmouth, which is definitely one of the most spectacular mounds that's part of the complex. So archaeologists in the past, when they talk about the Tremper Mound, they talk about it and they say it was an outlier. So it was what they call a hotel earthwork. Those were the people that lived here about 2,000 years ago. And they think that most of them were concentrated around Chillicothe, Ohio, and in Ross County, and that maybe there was this Tremper Mound down here in Portsmouth. But they don't connect it to the rest of the Portsmouth Earthworks complex. So it really needs to be taken as part of this grouping because there were actually additional earthworks there by Tremper Mound. So on the back of that green map is a map that was created in the mid-1800s by Dr. Hempstead, Dr. Giles Samuel Booth Hempstead, who was a physician here in Portsmouth. And on uh, the northwest side of that map, you can see he has indicated Tremper Mound, but he also shows a square there and an oval enclosure. So at one point in time, there was a 400 by 400 foot square near Tremper Mound. We don't know exactly where it was, there's no evidence of it left, but we do know that one corner of it intersected the Ohio and Erie Canal. Because when they were digging the canal, they actually found what they said were wagon loads, horse cart wagon loads of mica. So mica is a mineral that is found in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, and it is uh, kind of like in thin sheets, and it's really shiny. And I can, you guys can check this out. We actually have a bunch of this, so you don't have to worry about hurting this piece. But it's sort of translucent, and it's real shiny, and they would think prehistoric people could make mirrors out of it. It comes in these little flat sheets. But what they found at the Tremper Square were two foot by two foot sheets of this mica, so much of it that it filled it up several wagon loads. So this was in Georgia and North and South Carolina, and we're talking about a time when there were not horses here. So like you could take your canoe and you could go down the river, but you're not gonna take your boat back up the river, you're gonna have to walk back. Uh, so these people either traveled or traded many hundreds of miles to obtain material that they brought back here to Ohio. And that's one of the really neat things about the complex. So I will have these artifacts up here for you to look at. So once we get done talking, you're welcome to come up and check any of these out and handle them that you're interested in. Um, so the Tremper Mound was really neat. They excavated it in 1915. Uh, and what they found underneath it was what they call a great house or a charnel house. So this is where they cremated people and they processed the remains of the dead. So underneath the Tremper Mound, they found 600 post holes. So there was a multi-chambered structure underneath the Tremper Mound. In some of the rooms, they found workshops. So one of them was filled with animal bones that had cut marks on them. So they think they were having banquets and feasts at the Tremper Mound, which makes sense. That's something that we still do as part of our ceremonies that when people pass away is we have feasts to celebrate their life. And that's probably the same thing these prehistoric people did. They also had a workshop where the entire floor was filled with these chips of mica. So they would make ornaments out of them. They found one ornament there that was in the shape of a bear. 
Uh, so the artifacts that were discovered at Trevor Mound are because they were found on state property, and this includes city property, county property, township property, state property. If artifacts are found on public property, they belong to the state of Ohio. So those artifacts are now in Columbus. Uh, you used to be able to go up to the Ohio History Connection and look at a lot of these artifacts, but at the moment, uh, most of them have been taken off display and you can't look at them. Uh, so the Ohio History Connection is in the process of adding a lot of their Hopewell earthworks. They're trying to add them to the UNESCO World Heritage List. And as part of this process, because this is associated with indigenous cultures, they have to get approval from the existing indigenous people. So they are in negotiations with several dozen tribes that are now out west because they don't have any reservations here in Ohio. Those people were all driven out of the state. And so these people consider what came out of the Tremper Mound to be mortuary goods because there were burials and uh, cremated remains found in that mound. Uh, so right now they're redoing their policy. We're hoping at some point in the future they will put these back on display so that we can see them and learn from them and appreciate uh, the amazing artistry of their culture. But at this point in time, you can't do that. Uh, now, currently on the Ohio Memory website, if you go to ohiomemory.org and you type in Trumper Mound, the objects that were found there will come up. There are photographs of them and you can look at them. If you're interested, I encourage you to look at them soon because it's quite possible that they will all be purged in the future and that you will not be able to see them. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's really cool things in the Trumper Mound. Uh, the other part that's weird about it is that before they made the mound, that whole building that was underneath it was burned out of the ground. So the posts, they found some of them fallen over and they were burned. So they think that they either burned it on purpose. Uh, when the Spanish explorers came in the 1500s, they reported that some of the existing tribes had ancestor houses where they would actually display the bones of their ancestors. And it, was, it wasn't something they did for like trophy hunting or out of disrespect. It was something that they did to venerate their ancestors and to protect their remains. Uh, but what you did if you were an enemy tribe is you would try and go and burn down those people's charnel house because if they couldn't protect the bones of their ancestors, then their leader did not deserve to be leading them. Uh, so that's a possibility of something that could have happened in prehistoric times also. It's all a big mystery. We don't know why or how that happened. Uh, so as far as the rest of the complex goes, their Turkey Creek earthwork was located on Hempstead's map. There's an embankment near Turkey Creek where it makes that bow before it gets to the Ohio River. The embankment used to be about 20 feet, 25 feet high above the surrounding ground, and it was about two miles long. So the geologists think that that formation was a natural sandbar, which was created by the flooding of the river and the recession of the floods. Uh, but it also could have been modified. And what they do know is that there was a mound six feet tall on top of the embankment, which was about 200 feet wide. And there were also two semicircular cuts into the embankment, which were also about 200 feet across. And they think those were made by prehistoric people. So the embankment is actually still there. So Eli Allen, who is a local historian here uh, in the area, uh, got a really great photograph of it over the 4th of July where he took his drone up above it and you could see the whole embankment with the shadow of the sunset. So that's gonna be included in my book. Thank you, Eli, he's an amazing <laughs> photographer. Uh, so that's still here. Uh, the only other found out of the complex that is still here is the Scioto County Infirmary Mound, which some of you may know as the Bird Effigy Mound. So it's located in West Portsmouth, uh, near where Carrie's Run and 52 meet, across from Old Thomas Conley Riverside Park. Uh, this mound was partially excavated in the 1980s, and what makes it a really unique mound is it's one of the very few, just a handful of mounds in the state of Ohio that date to the archaic period. So the, the mounds that we've been talking about, most of them were built, they think, when Jesus walked the earth, so 2,000 years ago. And the infirmary mound, they think, dates back many more thousands of years. So the radiocarbon dates that they pulled out of that mound range from uh, 4,000 to 3,000 BC. So it's one of the oldest mounds in the whole state of Ohio. And they did a partial excavation, but the mound's still there. It's about 500 feet long by 300 feet. It's a really huge mound. And uh, it's one of a very special place because it's one of the few remaining mounds that's part of our earthworks. 
So I would like to answer some of your questions about uh, what life was like for prehistoric people here, or maybe about specific mounds, because I could sit here and talk probably for a week about <laughs> all kinds of things, but I want to cater this more to what you guys are interested in. Yes? No, no, the mounds aren't necessarily burial mounds, right? Uh, so that's a good point. So some of the mounds were burial mounds, but some of them were not. So like those parallel bankments that stretch for miles, they've never found any burials in any of those mounds. Uh, and then like the horseshoe mounds at Mount Park, those did not contain burials. Now that conical mound with the two trees growing out of it, that has potential to be a burial mound. A lot of those cone-shaped mounds had burials underneath them. So do they determine why they did this? Nobody knows why. They think that a lot of these were ceremonial, so there's a lot of alignments of the mounds. So it's pretty interesting that those horseshoe mounds are oriented directly north and south. Uh, the old fort, the central square, the points of the square point in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. There's alignments with some of them with like sunrises and sunsets, like especially at the solstice and the equinox. Uh, so they think maybe these people were watching the stars and that perhaps uh, some of these mounds related to perhaps ceremonies that they had. And now uh, they're also, the early explorers here, like especially Dr. Hempstead, thought that the square of the old Fort Earthwork was the pleasure grounds. So he thought they played games in the middle of the square, which makes a lot of sense. There were a lot of tribes that had a central square as part of their villages, and they would use that as a spot where they'd play games. So it may not all be for ceremony, there might be other purposes to it, but there's just so much mystery, nobody really knows. Uh, but yeah, the Old Fort Earthwork, they did excavations there, they found a village and some graveyards nearby, but they didn't find any people, nobody was buried in that mound. Like, none in the square, none in the wings of it. Uh, so there's a lot of these locations where there were not burials, and those are mysterious because nobody knows exactly what they were doing. Yes? Where was the last mound you talked about, the real prehistoric? So that, it was, that one is uh, the Scioto County Infirmary Mound. And the infirmary farm used to be located in West Portsmouth. So where Carrie's run in 52. So if you flip that map over and look at the green map, or you have the green map. Right. So it is across, there's one little spot there that says ETC Riverside Park. That's where Thomas Conley Riverside Park. And more toward the hills, is the Scioto County Infirmary Mound. Now, did the, the infirmary, because I, I was born in the area. Yes, yes. So by all the time, been walked that area. And friends even lived there, but was in charge of the county. Oh, wow, yeah. So I've been down there a lot. Did the home actually set on the mound? Yes, the home. I know after they shut it down, then the one of the Indian tribes, they built it. Yes, the Taliji Cherokee Nation was there for a while. Um, but yeah, the, the infirmary home was directly on top of the mound. So if you go there now, um, there's like a little area where you can kind of pull off the road and there's a guardrail. And if you look at that guardrail, like within the brush, there's actually the concrete sidewalk that went to the house and that went right up the side of the mound. Like there was actually an access road to the flood. Yeah, and that goes wraps around the behind the mound. Yep. It goes right through the, the center of it. Yes, that's correct. That's so yeah, from the back side, it's really tall to get to the top, but if you're in the front, the rise is probably five or six feet. Well, I think Charlie Brown, the attorney, he yeah. purchased all yep. that. And he spent it all the stuff. Yeah. Yes, which is fabulous because uh, the Raven Rock Nature Preserve is one of our most amazing locations. And there's actually a rock mound that was north of the Raven Rock Lookout Point. And if you hike up the Raven Rock Trail, off to the right, there's another stone mound, which is probably prehistoric. And so, and it's still there. The rocks are about this big, something you can carry and pack up in your hand. The one that used to be located at the very crest of the hill, they said they threw the rocks down over the cliff to use them as fill on the farm down there at one point in time. Uh, but we do have artifacts in the museum collection that came from the Raven Rock Stone Cairn, is what they call it, because it was one of the few mounds that was not just made of earth, it was made of stone also. And the top of it, they said, was baked hard like they had uh, signal fires up at the top of it. So they think they lit fires at the very high places on the hills so that they could communicate with each other up and down the valley and across the river. Uh, we've done renovations and even to this day we go out we had we associated all the 
the Indians, but right, the right. Shawnee were right there too. But yep. we found uh, you know arrowheads and different things just out in our backyard from from the bed. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the infirmary mound that when they excavated it, um, so in the eighties. They excavated it before the Cherokee were there. So um, they bulldozed about 18 inches off the top of it. The guy that I talked to that saw it said that when they bulldozed it, it looked like uh, white like foam because there were so many remains of bones and things that came out of it. They actually found skeletal remains of 47 individuals during that excavation and about 300 artifacts. And the individuals were allowed to be reburied with part of a Cherokee burial ceremony in Earl Thomas Conley Riverside Park. So the Popper Cemetery is where they buried the people that lived on the infirmary. And in that cemetery, if you go now, there's a marker there and it's a really low mound. And that's where they reinterred the 47 people that they discovered inside the Scioto County Infirmary Mound. So they put them in the Popper Cemetery because if you're buried in a cemetery, you're protected for 125 years. Nobody can dig you up until after that point in time. Uh, hopefully longer, but that's by law how long you're protected. Uh, so the commissioners at the time guaranteed the Cherokee that they would be protected because they were buried within that cemetery. So they passed a law in 1990 called the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, which now uh, protects all Native American graves indefinitely. So now it's known as a Native American cemetery, and those people will always remain there. They were not. They were buried just like normally, um, and so that was probably the practice that they did, like along, like during the archaic period. Maybe it was different than what they did uh, when the Pocono people were here. But it is interesting. Even in the Trumper Mound, they found a couple uh, full skeleton burials. So not everyone that was there was cremated. So you kind of wonder, like, how did they decide who was cremated and who was buried intact, like? Yeah, nobody really quite understands that whole process. Anybody else have any questions or things that you're interested to learn? What happened to all the, what happened to that civilization? Did so that's a good question. Uh, so we're not quite sure what happened to that civilization. The archaeologists think that they disappeared uh, sometime around 500 AD. And they don't quite know what happened there. Uh, but there were some different technological changes. So they think around like eight or 900 AD, they invented the bow and arrow. Uh, they started doing things a little bit differently. Instead of burying their dead in the mounds, a lot of times they would just dig into the mound and put people there and rebury it so they didn't have to carry all of those basket loads of earth. But if you think about it, like in 100 years, how much does our culture change? And how much do our ways and our traditions change? So if you're thinking about a period of a thousand years, like that's a long time for it to change. And the way that they categorize these cultures is by their burial practices and by the material they leave behind. So once that changes enough, they consider it a different culture. So by about a thousand AD, they call it the four ancient culture. And even the Hopewell, prior to the Hopewell was supposed to be the Adena. So we're talking going into about 2000 BC, to maybe 1500 BC were the people they called Adena. But now the archeologists argue that maybe the Adena were the Hopewell, they just changed a little bit. Because a lot of their materials is exactly the same. And the only thing that's any different is they think Adena people made conical mounds and they think Hopewell people made more of these linear mounds. But at all of the Hopewell sites, you find conical mounds most of the time. Mm -hmm. So it gets a little muddy. Yes? I got two questions. Sure. Could they be roads? I mean, because you said it were, was eight miles long, mm -hmm. eight mile ways that was in, you know, like through forests and stuff that were safe. I wondered that. And then I wondered if they were trading back and forth, did they have math and, and alphabets and did they have any of that? So, um, the, as far as the paths go, we do think those are roads. So those embankments kind of made a road that they probably kept cleared so you could move from one location in the earthworks to another. And they have those paths at other uh, Hopewell earthworks like in Chillicothe and Ross County and like at Newark. Uh, so that is something that they see repeated and they probably are roads. But if you were trading like, I think they got like stuff in Indiana. Yep. Down in Georgia. Wouldn't they have to have some kind of a system where they would barter and trade and, and have coins or not? Some, some kind of knowledge of money and, 
you know, they have yeah, and it could have been direct barter. Uh, one of the things we find around here a lot are these little disc shaped stones, which they call discoidals. And so a lot of people think that they're game pieces, and they make big ones. And when the Spanish explorers came, uh, there were some big ones that had a flat edge, and they would play a game which they called chunky. So they would take those stones and they'd roll them, and they'd throw spears at them, and whoever got their spear closest got a point. And they played this game all day long. Uh, they said the Indian name for it literally translated to running hard labor. <laughs> Right, so they had to count. Uh, but then there's small ones of these discoidals, and some of them don't have a very good edge on them, so it'd be really difficult to play that game with them. And then at that point, they've got different weird markings on them, and some of them are, have different designs on them. So you start to wonder, like, what were they doing with them? Like, you can see how maybe they'd be game pieces. So if you're playing Monopoly, you don't want everybody to have the same piece. So, like, maybe those were pieces. But the other thing people have suggested is maybe they were money. So they had different markings on them, so maybe that designated, like, something that had to do with money, but we don't know. Maybe they directly bartered and traded with each other. Uh, they do not have any known written language. Uh, so there have been a few pieces found here and there that look like they might have alphabetic writing on them, but most of those by archaeologists are considered to be fraudulent objects. Uh, so as far as we know, the closest thing they had to language are these tablets that were inscribed with the, maybe pictograms but we don't really quite know what they represent and we don't know if those were ornamental or whether they were meant to communicate something else. So very good questions. But yeah, we don't know. <laughs> A lot of my answers are gonna be, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yes. You weren't there. No, I wasn't. <laughs> weren't there mounds that actually traversed the entire state of Ohio from one end to another? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, as much as this is, it's a drop in the bucket. It is. It's the massive amount of that that was done. Yeah, it's really impressive. Well, and the other part of it, like a lot of it wasn't recorded. A lot of these were in the areas where they plowed, so like how much of it got destroyed that we'll never even know existed. So, and they say that anywhere you go along the Ohio River and the Scioto River, pretty much anywhere, is a prehistoric site. And how would serpent mounds uh, be related to these mounds? Uh, there could be. So Serpent Mound is about 30 miles to the northwest of us in Peebles, and Serpent Mound is the largest effigy mound in the entire word, world. Effigy is a fancy word for in the shape of an animal or a person, so it's obvious what shape it is. It's in the shape of a snake. Uh, but they're, they're arguing now about how old it is. So there's one archaeologist named William Romain, and he's with the Indiana Museum, and he's done some radiocarbon dates with the serpent mound that date to the Adena period, which would make it one of the earliest mounds. And then there's another guy named Brad Lepper, who is the head archaeologist at the Ohio History Connection, and he's taking radiocarbon dates at the mound, which date to the late prehistoric period, which would make it one of the latest mounds. The, like the closest to our time that we have out of all the mountains. And so they write scientific papers back and forth and argue with each other about <laughs> what's going on. Uh, one of the things that Bill Romain pointed out recently was that the radiocarbon dates that Brad Leopard took were from a site in the mound that had previously been excavated and then had been backfilled. So his dates may be inaccurate. They also say that there are uh, four ancient culture burials at, in mounds nearby Serpent Mound, and that there is an Adena Mound there, which is a conical mound, but they say there's no Hopewell, but that's not true. Because there is one mound that was built up in layers, and in the top layer of this mound, they have found artifacts that they consider to be diagnostic of the Hopewell culture. So Serpent Mound kind of has the same story of all of the mounds, is that there were people here before the mounds were built, since it's about the end of the Ice Age, and that when they started building the mounds, a lot of times they'd build an initial layer and then they'd come back and add another layer and another burial. And that the people that lived here transformed the landscape to suit their purposes and the people that lived after them did the same thing. And that people were buried in and around these mounds for the entire span of prehistory. So here in Portsmouth, we've got mounds in the Archaic period, we've got mounds that they think were Adena mounds, we've got mounds that they think were Hopewell mounds, and we've got mounds that they think were Fort Ancient mounds. And they're all kind of part of each other. There are certain mounds that span the whole gamut. So they actually found uh, Fort Ancient artifacts 
and radiocarbon dates in the Sayuri County Infirmary Mound that dated to the late prehistoric period. So it's just like, and it's the same thing we're doing today. We're reusing the landscape and we're changing it to suit our purposes. And if you go up to Piketon to Mound Cemetery, you will actually find uh, burials dating up to even 1985 where people were buried into the mounds that were prehistoric. So people are still doing the same thing that they did <laughs> the whole time before. Yes? Uh, what's amazing to me is how, we'll say in places like Europe and foreign countries, they excavate down 30 or 40 feet below a city and find entire cities. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that happen? I, I, you know, I just build over it and 500 or 1,000 years later, you rediscover it. Right. Well, you got to level it out to build the next building, so it's probably easier to just like put some dirt on top and build up. Which the potential for archaeology here, like considering how much the mounds have been torn up, is pretty amazing. And uh, Charles Wirtz wrote a manuscript in the 1930s where he discovered finding flint debris uh, down near the Turkey Creek earthwork, and it was eight feet below the surface. So especially if you're living somewhere here where the river floods and it lays down that silt, like if you pay attention, like sometimes the river will come and it'll strip away a lot of land, but sometimes it'll come and it'll lay down a ton of mud. Uh, so like there's probably, and that was in the 1930s when he wrote the manuscript, so if it was eight feet below the surface now, think about how much further buried it is. So the archaeologists, uh, when they were building Earl Thomas Conley Riverside Park, they tried to find Alexandria and they tried to find Lower Shawnee Town and they couldn't find it. They said it wasn't there. Uh, but we have reports from eyewitness accounts, multiple ones, that it was there, but they only went down three feet. So if Charles Brooks was trying to think eight feet below the surface, then maybe they just didn't go down far enough to find it. I bet if they went 30 feet down, who knows what they would find. Yeah. Where do these names come from that we've given these folks? Very good question they also. Call themselves no. That so they did not have written language and none of us was ever around to talk with them, so we have no idea what they called themselves. So all the names that are applied to them are applied arbitrarily. Uh, most of the time the names are connected with the person that owned the land at the time when it was excavated. So Tremper Mound is named after Senator Tremper, Dr. Tremper, who is a dentist here. Uh, so when they did the excavation in 1915, he was the landowner, so now we know it as Tremper Mound. So Adina was the property of Thomas Worthington, who was Ohio's first governor, and he uh, named his estate Adina because he read in a book that it was a Hebrew word that meant the, that it was a place that was delightful. And so that's what he called his estate. And there was a big conical mound there, and when they excavated it in 1907, uh, they found artifacts, and it was the first time they'd ever found any artifacts like that, so they just called those people Adina. And because that was the first one that they excavated, that became what they call the type site. So these are the type of artifacts that are Adena. And so anytime they ever found those artifacts again, they called those Adena people. Uh, so the Hopewell Earthworks, which not a Hopewell, it is a Hopewell culture earthwork, but it's specifically named Hopewell Earthwork. It has a designation, 33RO, Ross County 33 is what they call Ohio in their list of states, 27, that's the name of it. So this specific site, the Hopewell Group in Chillicothe, Ohio, was on the property of a guy named Mordecai Cloud Hopewell. And because it, he owned it when they excavated it, we now call those people Hopewell. So yeah, very good question. So it all has to do with whoever owned the property, mostly at the time. Uh, so yeah, now that's just what we call them. So it could be that several days we have named is different, they're all really the same. Right, so that's what archaeologists say now that that term Medina is outdated and that really all those people were Hopewell. It's just they had some minor changes in their culture over the thousands of years that they existed. And then some of the archaeologists really consider it more of um, like a belief system. So it was like their culture was tied to their ceremony and their religious belief and those were why they made those materials and this is how they buried their people and that's how they defined their culture. That's interesting. Down would be towards the Turk Creek area. Yeah. There's a anybody that come along beside their boat and anybody's been on the boats, that's one of the ways you spend your Sunday afternoons, especially after a rain. Oh yeah. One area especially called Beans Beach. And I mean 
we've done that for years. You go down there, you find pottery. But there again, right. they attributed to the Indians. But yep. for a friend of mine is big in collecting the mm -hmm. yep. And um, he, he has an extensive collection. But he said that area over there. And then I think we also had Frank Teach spoke with us one time. And he was talking about that area. They were there, like, what do you say, for like 5,000 years? Mm -hmm. So, so Bernie Teach, Frank Teach's son. Like you said, every time it rains, it floods. Yep, it brings them all up. All kind of, uh, all, all kind of this material. So Vernon Teach, who is Frank Teach's son, is now the adjunct curator of the Southern Ohio Museum Wirtz Collection. So he was friends with Bill Wirtz and knew a lot about the area and the different places where people lived and how they lived. So he's been really helpful in uh, helping us to curate the collection and interpret it. So yeah, there's a lot of knowledge that local collectors have in the area of the artifacts. I will encourage anyone that does collect artifacts uh, if you find something, it would do a lot of good if you take some ink and you write on it where you found it. Because later down the road, it's real easy. Like, shoot, a week from now, I wouldn't remember where I found it exactly. Uh, but it adds so much value to it. And later, that also tells us, like, these are the objects that are found here. Because once you pick it up and you carry it away, there's no way to just put it back. Uh, and it's just so valuable to know, like, oh, these are the types of artifacts that we find in this exact location. And so that's why we were so excited to get the catalog. Uh, so Bill Works didn't do a lot of cataloging. He wrote on a few of his pieces where they're from, and we have that information. But gosh, I could just imagine what it would be like if they would have written, like known where everything that they found was uh, originated. But I do have some pieces of pottery up here. So if you are on the riverbank and you're finding pieces of pottery, and if it's glazed and it's shiny, it's probably historic pottery. But if you find it and uh, it looks like it has these little white flecks all in it. That is what they call shell temper. So sometime around 1000 AD, they think, they started burning shell and then adding it to pottery. And this keeps the pottery from cracking when it's fired or expanding too much or contracting too much. And that is how you tell it's a prehistoric piece of pottery. A lot of times you'll find cord markings, so they do think that they uh, made twine and cords and they wrap these around a paddle and then they press it into the wet clay to make impressions and decorations on their pottery. So if you find pieces like these, that's uh, probably exactly what that is. So we've got some pieces here that were donated to the museum's educational collection by Mark Coon. And these were all pieces of pottery that were found at the Fort Village, uh, uh, kind of where UPS and the dog pound is now. So that used to be a prehistoric village site. And it's really cool because these are probably a thousand years old. So it's just really neat to just like I hold it in my hand and I knew that somebody made this like a thousand years ago. Uh, it's kind of neat to think about. Anybody else questions, comments? I don't want to take up too much of your time. Yes? Tell us about some of our art collection. Yes. So uh, probably the most spectacular find uh, discovery that they've ever made in the entire country was Tremper Mountain. Uh, so I'll give you a little background. Back in the 1840s, uh, Squire was coming through and doing this study for the Smithsonian. He partnered up with Edwin Davis, who was a resident here in Ohio. He lived uh, more up towards central Ohio. And they did an excavation at Mound City in Chillicothe. And in one of the mounds at Mound City, which they call Pipe Mound, they found 60 pipes that were carved in the shape of animals. And they were so well carved that you could tell exactly what species they were. And this was like everybody's head over heels. This is the most amazing thing that they ever found, ever. And it really is like the height of prehistoric artistry. And uh, then in 1915, they excavated the Tramper Mound. And what did they find? They found a little pocket in the bottom of the floor where there were 60 pipes carved in the shape of animals. And the same thing. They actually think that from the style of them, that perhaps it was one person that carved the pipes in the Tremper Mound, and the same person might have carved the pipes that were found at Mount City. Uh, so this is just like, truly amazing. The pipes from Mount City ended up being sold to the British Museum. So you have to go to London to see those. But the pipes that they found at the Tremper Mound are in the Ohio History Connection collection. So, what are they carved out of? So they are carved out of pipe stone. So I do have some samples here. These ones are plaster replicas. Obviously, I don't have the real thing. Uh, but there are some pieces of pipe stone here, which is a really soft stone. Uh, so directly across the side of the river 
from the Tramper Mound is the Fort Mounds Village, and at the top of Fort Hill there is what they call the prehistoric Fort Pipestone Quarry. So they actually find pits dug into that layer of soil, and there are pockets of pipestone on that hill. And they would dig out that pipestone, and it's real soft and easy to carve, so they would make pipes with it. There's also uh, th that same band of pipestone you can find in Kentucky, so at the crest of like Morning View Hill there, behind the Temple Mound, Portsmouth Group C, there's also potential prehistoric pipestone quarries. But what I find fascinating is they've done some studies recently, and the pipes that they found at the Tremper Mound, they think were made out of pipestone that came from the Sterling prehistoric pipestone quarry in Illinois. So they brought in this exotic pipestone. They don't know for sure if they carved it there and brought it here, or if they brought it here and then carved it. They found pieces of pipestone chips at the Tramper Mound, so they think maybe there was carving and a workshop being done here. Uh, but then they also did studies on the pipes that they found at Mount City, the similar cache of pipes, and the pipes at Mount City they think were built or were made from Fort Quarry from here in Portsmouth. So apparently it's far enough away, 40 miles north of here in Chillicothe, that like it was cool to use our pipe stone. But when you could go right across the river a mile and a half away, they'd rather get some pipe stone from Illinois because it was, uh, you know, it's cooler to have stuff you can't find readily available. <laughs> but it is interesting to look at because the pipes that they find in Tremble Mound are more monotone. It's kind of like some grayish brown tones and that's that sterling pipe stone. But the pipes that are in the Mound City collection, you can actually go to the British Museum's website and they have their collections online. And so you can search their digital collections, and if you type in Mount City, all those pipes come up, so you can look at pictures of them, and they're so brightly colored. Like the pipes down at Fort Village comes in yellow and pink and red and gray and brown and all these different tones. And those pipes from Mount City, they're just really colorful and spectacular because they're made from our pipes. Uh, yeah, well, those ones are painted shiny, so they are polished. So when you polish it, it does get a kind of machine to it. So you can see like this piece has been pretty well polished here. And then we also have some hard stone tools. So this is what they call a grooved axe. So this would have had a wooden handle associated with it. But what happens when you bury a wooden handle in a mound for 2,000 years in our climate? It's not gonna last that long. Uh, so we don't find the handles, but we do find the axes. And they think that it was lashed to a handle, like maybe there was a twig that came up on both sides of it, and then they tie it on the top and they tie it on the bottom. And then they use it to chop trees down. They'd have to stop every hour or so and sharpen it up. So what you find is they start out really big, and a lot of our ceremonial axes are still pretty large. But as they use it, they get shorter and shorter and shorter until there's not much left of them because uh, they're sharpening them as they use them. But the drawback to this grooved axe is that as they chopped, it would get loose in its handle and you'd have to strap it back down. So there was a prehistoric technological development and they started to make what they call a celt. So this one's made of flint, but you also find these in hard stones which I should also point out that these hard stones are not native. Some of them might have been carried down the river, but a lot of them they think they traveled or traded to get that really hard material. So this one's flint, but this one doesn't have a groove, so they think it was actually embedded into the handle, so as you used it, it stayed nice and tight and you didn't have to re redo it. But there are reports that um, Native Americans, like the Cherokee, would actually embed their cell into a living tree. So the tree would actually grow around it super tight, and then they could carve the whole handle out of that wood, and it would never come loose. This one's probably my favorite. This one is, uh, like if I found this, I wouldn't think it was anything. <laughs> it doesn't look like much. Uh, but it was actually specifically carved to fit in your hand, and you could use it without a handle as a hammer, and they call it a hammer ship. Uh, this one is a pestle, so this is a hand pestle, but sometimes they call them a bell pestle, so you'd have a mortar to grind, and you could grind up your acorns and your nuts and your berries and your grains with that. Uh, I've got just a seashell example here, because uh, this isn't pre-sword, probably. <laughs> Somebody picked it up and brought it back from the beach, but it is a really good example of materials. So we live in an area where there's abundant shell. There's a ton of clam shells. You can go down to the river and you can find them all over the place. Uh, but what we find in the mounds a lot of times are marine shells. So these people have traveled or traded to the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico to get these materials, and they bring them back and they make beads and necklaces and ornaments out of them, and we find those here in our area. They said when they were uh, redoing the mouth of the Sayota River, when they put in the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal, 
that they, about eight feet below the surface, or five feet, I don't remember. Anyway, they found multiple whole seashells. And they think those were part of the Portsmouth Air Force complex. People left those behind. Uh, the farthest away traded commodity is obsidian, volcanic glass. And they found in 2020 when they put in the walking paths and electrical trenches for the lighting at Mountain Park, uh, they found nearly 5,000 prehistoric Native American artifacts. The state park, it's, on private, or it's on public property, so those are all now in the OHC collection. But one of the things they found were worked pieces of obsidian. And when they tested them, they think they came from Yellowstone. So that's 1,500 miles away. Wow. So if you think about 1,500 miles as their trading radius, like that's a really good area. Like they're trading nearly on the scale that we are today across the entire continent. Uh, we also have copper objects in the museum collection. Copper was mined around Lake Superior, so they have prehistoric copper mines, pits dug in around the lake where they would bring back copper. They didn't think people had the technology to melt it or smelt it, but they think they hammered it cold or maybe warmed it up and hammered it into sheets and made really neat ornaments out of it. We have one in the museum collection, which is a copper cell or axe, and um, uh, this one came from Trumper Mound. So the other source of copper was in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, the same places where they gather mica, the same places where they bring back uh, slate and banded slate to make their ornaments. So there's a big connection between where we are and then like Southern Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia, there where they would source their materials. And we find actually a lot of the same objects here and there. So there was some kind of cultural connection between these people where they were familiar with those objects. Well, thank you guys so much. I've got plenty of papers you can come up and take. You're welcome to check out any objects. Uh, yeah, so I have uh, some handouts here for the museum. We've got advertising for our concert we've got coming up. I've got uh, some cards here for our exhibition that we have featured in our main gallery, which also has some events on the back of it. And uh, if you haven't seen the Cirque d'Art Theater performance, I encourage you to come out and check those out these next uh, couple Saturdays. Thank you.